Um, so hi everyone, uh, good evening or good morning, uh, fellow uh, Harvard alumni and guests. Uh, I am uh, Pavlos Foriades, college class of 1988 uh, and currently a director representing clubs and six at the HA board. We have a very international gathering today. Uh, I, I, I know that people are still joining us, but um, we've had uh, nearly 400 registrations emanating from more than uh, 25 countries in Europe and around the world. I welcome you all to our exciting uh, speech and discussion with uh, Professor Bharat Anand, which is part of the HA Speaker Bureau program and is organized by the eight clubs that comprise our Southeastern European region. Part of our mission as Harvard Alumni Association is to facilitate the transfer of knowledge, insights, and new ideas to our alumni around the world uh, through renowned world thinkers, like Professor Anand, who not by chance is one of the most sought after faculty speakers of our alma mater and to whom we are deeply thankful for accepting to be our keynote speaker today. I'd like to introduce to you uh, two of my uh, colleagues who lacked as uh, moderators uh, today. Um, uh, Errol uh, Dagomas, uh, Kennedy School MPA, class of 2015. Hello. Errol um, uh, is the president of the Harvard Club of, um, uh, of Turkey and Mikhail Priadilnikov, PhD from the government department in 2010. Mikhail. Hey guys. Uh, Mikhail is the uh, president of the Harvard Club of, uh, of, of Russia. Uh, before I uh, introduce our speaker, I would like to give you a, a um, uh, some practical tips for, for today. Uh, our whole event will last about an hour, so we, we have uh, delayed a bit the beginning and we might uh, um, take the full 60 minutes for the speech and the uh, question part. Um, after the speech, we have allocated time for, for uh, questions and, and answers. Please use the chat function in the Zoom application. That's, that's the function you can see at the bottom of your screen. Um, and um, uh, preferably also uh, giving uh, together with the question, the, your name and uh, the school and your, your year of graduation. Um, all the questions will reach the moderators who will use all the allocated time for your uh, Q&A. Um, and uh, now on to our um, uh, speaker of the day, our, uh, our uh, guest of honor. Professor Barat is an expert in digital strategy, digital marketing and corporate strategy. His work has examined competition in content industries, focusing on two central challenges that firms increasingly face getting noticed and getting paid. He created Harvard Business School's first executive program on digital strategies for media companies. He has written over 50 articles and case studies and his scholarly work has received various awards and been profiled in a range of media outlets. His work on digital transformation has influenced startups and established companies worldwide and he has advice organizations across the globe. His book, The Content Trap, A Strategist's Guide to Digital Change, has received acclaim for its perspective on strategy and digital transformation. It was named as one of Fast Company's top 10 business books of 2016 and Bloomberg's best books of 2017. And I can personally more than recommend it. In 2014, Professor Anand helped create and launch the digital learning platforms for Harvard Business School Online, which was for, formerly known as HBX. HBSO's virtual classroom has been described by Fortune as the classroom of the future. In his current role as Vice Provost, 
Professor Anand has led Harvard University's efforts to formulate, communicate, and implement strategic priorities around online learning and to leverage technology to create more effective teaching tools, strategies, and resources for residential teaching across the university, something which is so imperative during the times, during the current times. Since his March, Professor Anand has been a part of the central leadership efforts to support and oversee the university's transition to remote teaching. Professor Anand is also a renowned teacher and a two-time winner of the Best Teacher Award at Harvard Business School. He has a PhD in economics from Princeton University. But most importantly, he's a graduate of the great Harvard College class of 1988, Magna Cum Laude. He is uh, also a recipient of the Green Hill Award for outstanding contributions to Harvard Business School. Please join me in welcoming Professor Anand. Bharat, the floor, so to say, is yours. Thank you, Pavlos. It's such a pleasure to be here with, uh, with all of you. I guess it's uh, eve early evening, uh, so I'm grateful for everyone for taking the time. And, uh, and as Pavlos said, I'm particularly thrilled to be here and introduced by my former classmates. So thank you, Pavlos, for, uh, for that. So let me, um, let me just share my screen. <coughs> Let me know if you can uh, see this. Is that okay? Great. So what um, you know, what I thought I'll do is spend um, half an hour or so just offering some perspectives on this topic of digital strategy and transformation. Um, <clears throat> and and I thought we might touch on uh, the following questions. Uh, so as Pavlos mentioned, I um, I've been here on the faculty for twenty three, close to twenty four years now. And most of my work in this area began in the mid to late 90s, um, really looking at the industries that were, if you will, affected first in the economy, things like newspapers and music and so on and so forth. And, um, and I refer to those industries as the canaries in the digital coal mine, meaning a lot of what we're seeing today play out in sectors like retail and banking and even education, um, you know, the question is what learnings can we get from this set of industries, the content industries that have experienced digital transformation for now a quarter century, right? So that's really going to be one of the major themes of the talk. The underlying question, if you will, is the second one, which is um, not only what does one need to win in these spaces and how is it different from analog uh, context, but what does it mean to be customer centric? in a digital world. And so I'll offer some thoughts on that. Along the way, I might offer some implications for the future of learning. And, you know, I'm not going to spend much of the time on this, on this aspect, though, as Pablo said, um, you know, much of the last nine months, one has been spending basically 24 seven really um, helping uh, colleagues uh, around the university to transition to remote teaching as we, um, as we geared up uh, after lockdown down in March um, this year. So, um, so that's the agenda. Let me um, just start with this one um, set of observations, which is when we think about the formulae for digital success, uh, these are oftentimes the main axioms, I think that we would start with, which is you need quality product. Uh, really the opportunity offered by digital is massive reach. One requires a fair amount of creativity to be able to navigate digital trains and come up with new ideas for consumers. Data is obviously something that's critical and you can leverage. And finally, as a metaphor, content is king or product is king, right? To succeed in the digital domain. Um, and by the way, along the way, um, you know, I'll make remarks uh, that um, I would, I, would, I would submit probably extend to nonprofit and other sectors as well, and we can take that up in the Q&A. So these are almost axioms that we take for granted when we think about digital success. Um, and what I would start by submitting is that these axioms are neither necessary nor sufficient 
for digital success. And in fact, to take it a step further, might even in some cases be wrong. And so that's really the headline of, of this talk and what I'll try and convince you in the next half an hour is why that's the case, okay? So I have, um, I have two stories that I wanted to share. Um, the first is newspapers, and this is the first sector that was hit by digital once uh, the internet came along in 1994. This is a newsprint facility, uh, and you might ask what happens to this facility 10 years from now or 15 years from now, and the answer is pretty simple, which is online news is basically gonna disrupt uh, or has already disrupted uh, physical newspapers. Why? Because when we think about the attributes of the online product, the digital product, so to speak, we enjoy many features like real-time updating. It's much easier to search. There's greater variety, rich media. It's not just text, it's video and audio. Anytime, anywhere access and so on and so forth, right? It is hard to think of a digital product that dominates the physical product in so many respects. And you see this in the data when we look at the decline in print circulation per household. So this is US data. Uh, it's basically declined by 70 to 80%. Uh, by the way, one of the things I apologize I noted um, is that I'd left out the time axis, which is not, um, which is not something I should have done um, coming from business school. So that's probably the first question you're asking is what are this time axis? So, so um, maybe I can ask you to reflect on this question, which is when exactly did this decline start? Which month and year? And you're welcome to write it in chat as well. Uh, as you think about that, you know, one of the things that, um, that we often converge to is, is the premise that this decline started probably mid 90s with the introduction of the internet. Some might consider uh, with broadband, late 90s, early 2000s. Others might suggest with the smartphone, late 2000s. Well, it turns out that this decline, I didn't leave out the time axis, the decline actually started 70 years. It started with radio, then black and white TV, then color TV, then cable TV, then cable news, then 24 by seven cable news. Finally, the internet hits. By the way, notice one thing, the impact of the internet is empirically indistinguishable from 70 years of technology that came before it. The story we hear about online news being the major culprit for destroying newspapers, and by the way, there's still stories written today on this, is essentially wrong. So what really happened? Well, by now we know the story, which is the decline in newspapers had very little to do with news going online. And by the way, when you look at the red line, that is circulation revenues for all US newspapers over the last 20 years. The declines in circulation were offset by price increases. So that circulation revenues are pretty much stable. Who would have thought that? The decline has to do with the light blue line, which is classifieds job postings, real estate postings, card listings. That accounts for roughly 45% of revenues of most newspapers, more than half the profits. That basically disappears. Online classified skilled newspapers, not online news. But that gives rise to a puzzle, which is when we look at the attributes of online classifieds, they're pretty much the same as online news. Real-time updating, easier to search, greater variety, and so on. And yet the declines in circulation are small, whereas the declines in classifieds are massive. I think trying to understand this distinction gets to the heart of what I would consider to be one of the major stories about the digital revolution. What is that? And this is a metaphor for many other industries. There's fundamentally something different about how we consume news and how we consume classifieds online. When it comes to news products, you know, which are the sites that you and I like to go to? Well, it depends. You might like Yahoo or CNN or Google. I might like the New York Times. Why? It depends on product attributes. Things like trust in the news source, variety, the design of the site, interactivity, the price, and so on and so forth. We're making decisions based on product attributes. When that's the case, digital comes along and we can take products we create and now reach many more consumers. That was the major benefit of digital. It turns out the way we consume classifieds is fundamentally different, which is the major thing that determines which classified site you and I go to is simply a question of where are the sellers. 
And where do the sellers go? Where there's the buyers. So buyers affect sellers, sellers affect buyers. This gives rise to a phenomenon called network effects, where the value I get from a product depends not only on the attributes of the product, it depends on who else is there. My value depends on the presence of other sellers and other buyers. This is, I think, at the heart of digital uh, change, digital success, digital transformation. Uh, this is also what I call in the book, the tension between strategies based on content and strategies based on connections. One other way to think about this is traditionally we produced stuff in the hub. We sold it to consumers in the spokes. Internet comes along, we can now reach many more spokes. That's the way most organizations think about the benefits of digital. But I would consider that to be just scratching the surface, which is most of the benefits in fact don't arise from that. It arises not just from hub to spoke, but spoke to hub interactions. That customers can talk back to us. They can tell us what they like and don't like. They can interact with us. They can produce stuff. We can get data and leverage personalization. So that's spoke to hub. That's the second benefit. But the third and most major benefit of digital technologies is really not just about hub to spoke and spoke to hub. It's leveraging spoke to spoke connections. Uh, by the way, when you think about every digital giant, it embodies spoke to spoke dynamics. When strategies based on content clash with strategies based on connections, the latter usually wins. It's not a matter of personal belief, it's just a matter of the economics. Once I'm ahead in a network market, I get slightly more customers, I get even further ahead, and soon you end up with winner take all or winner take most markets. Uh, so that's the first thing, which is newspapers died not because of online content, but because of online networks. And the real promise of digital is not about reach, but connectedness. That's something I'd just love for you to think in and keep in mind. By the way, even digital giants get this wrong. So when we think about the classic battles in technology, right? Apple versus Microsoft. What's interesting is when Apple introduced the Mac, 1984, Pavlos, you and I were freshmen at that time. The thing that was pretty clear was the Mac was a better product than the PC. It was plug and play. I could just use the mouse and move around and do things. Here I had to learn DOS and all these commands. It was an ugly uh, machine. And when Steve Jobs introduced the Mac, he said, this is an insanely great product. And by the way, he used that term always for every subsequent product. These are insanely great. Well, it turns out insanely great, one three percent market share. The worst quality product got 97% market share. And that's because Microsoft was not competing on the basis of product quality. It had the network. It didn't have just one network, it had two networks. The larger the installed base, the more easy for you and me to share files with each other. That's a direct customer to customer network. The larger the installed base, the more likely app developers would build for the PC platform, which gives rise to more customers and so on and so forth. By the way, we've just seen the greatest transformation in corporate history with Apple over the last 20 years, trillion dollars in value. Almost all the value has come from ancillary products, the iPod, the iPhone, the iPad, the iWatch and so on. When you think about what happened in the PC market, over the last 19 years, Apple's market share has gone from 3% to about 9%. That's it. Another way of saying this is Microsoft has made virtually every mistake known to mankind for 15 years and still 91% market share. That's the power of networks. It gives you a license to make mistakes. And then over the last several years with Satya coming in, they're basically over a trillion dollars in value with top three market uh, Marriott versus Airbnb. This is a tweet from an Airbnb executive. I like to tell my students, please don't tweet in this way. It's a pretty rude tweet. But one of the things they're saying is that Marriott sells hotel rooms. We will connect people who have rooms with people who want rooms. We're just creating platform dynamics. Uh, Uber, we all know the story. Here's something that's really interesting. When Uber starts, it starts with its own cars and its own drivers, Uber Black. 
and it grows at a pretty nice pace. But soon they realize we can't keep up with demand, so they open up to third-party partner drivers, and that's when it really takes off. Another way of saying this is, if you want growth, it's great to innovate, but if you want exponential growth, think about connecting. Uh, people often ask me, sort of, uh, what's the exemplar of these kinds of connections? And I think it's not West but East, um, Tencent in China. Some of you have probably heard of WeChat. Um, by the way, Tencent was the inspiration for, in fact, um, several uh, equivalent product offerings in Russia, including Mail.ru. Um, the thing that I find interesting is uh, Tencent starts with an instant messaging service two plus 20 plus years ago called QQ, only function to get people to connect. The problem is you can't monetize instant messaging services, right? They're all free. So they win 95% market share, but then how do you monetize? This is before email and broadband in China. So most people's online identity was really the eight digit QQ number. That's fine, except when you have a billion people with eight digits, it's hard to stand out. So what they say is choose your eight digit number that you want, personalize it to yourself and just pay 99 cents. Sort of like a personalized license plate. 3% of the users take advantage of that. That's enough to generate massive amount of revenue for the company. They go a step further and they say, this is before broadband. We couldn't upload our pictures online. So they say, okay, here's some emojis. You can choose your personal identity, except there's 500 emojis for a billion people. So again, hard to stand out. They give people the option of personalizing their emojis. Choose a virtual Gucci shirt to put on your emoji. And for that pay 99 cents, like literally. If only 3% of the, of the market takes advantage of that, that's $3 billion in revenue. This is how they start growing. They move from instant messaging to social networks, to multiplayer games, finally to WeChat, which of course is not just an instant messaging service. It's being used for reading books, for watching movies. And I find this fascinating is when they introduce the red envelope virtually. A lot of people in China like to give cash through red envelopes during Christmas, Chinese New Year. They said virtual red envelope. I send this to Pablos, he opens it. It's a gift and money gets transferred from my account to his instantaneously their market share in mobile e-commerce goes from 19 to 37%. That's connectedness amongst users. Coming back to media, um, and we know have, we have some folks from Norway on the call, including I think uh, a few from Shipstead. Uh, this is uh, probably the media company that has inspired my thinking the most when it comes to digital transformation. They see the problem early in classifieds. They move to create online classifieds. And then they win dominant market share in Norway, move to Sweden, move to France with Le Bacouin, and then to many countries around the world. By the way, what's interesting is uh, in online classifieds, they have 95% share in real estate and jobs. They say in their annual report, we have 115% market share in cars. So I went to them a few years ago and I said, I know you guys are smart, but you're not that smart. Market shares have to add up to 100%. And they said, no, our site is so liquid that people in Germany, Denmark, and Finland are posting cars on the Norwegian classified site. So there's more cars sold in the site than there are cars in Norway, and they charge 50 bucks a listing. That's a money machine. What's interesting to me in particular is that they then use this to leverage connectivity through the newsroom. You all remember the story, the Icelandic uh, volcanic uh, crisis, a decade ago, I'm not going to pronounce the name. This obviously spread all across Europe. During this crisis, the big question is, what are the stories that people care about? So the Shipstead news sites were putting out stories around the weather implications, what are the weather patterns, when is the weather going to move, what are the health implications, uh, how are people uh, sort of coping with this crisis. Those were all stories that they thought were relevant. No one reads these stories. Why? During that moment, people were stuck. All air travel disrupted in Norway. People started posting messages on the Shipstead sites saying, I want to get from Oslo to Trondheim. Is anyone traveling? Someone else replies, yep, I can take three people with me. Meet me at three o'clock at the train station. They see this. They go to their IT team. 
They set up an app within seven hours called Hitchhiker Central, whose only function was to allow readers to communicate on rides with each other. This becomes the most popular app, not just in Norway, but in Europe. And it gave rise to a fundamental question within the newsroom, which is how can we help readers help each other? Spoke to spoke, not broadcast or hub to spoke. Okay. By the way, just as an aside, uh, seven years ago when we were thinking about creating HBS online, I was asked to lead this effort. We started creating a platform um, with courses, with faculty, and we thought we'll create the best platform, the best content, the best faculty. And three months into the effort, I realized there were a few students, MBA students, who were telling me something. They said, Professor Allen, we don't just learn from the faculty in the classroom, we learn from each other. We learn in study groups outside the classroom. We learn in the lunch corridor, in the gym conversations. They were basically talking about spoke to spoke, social learning, peer to peer learning. Here I am writing this book called The Content Trap, and we are falling into the same trap. This is how insidious the problem is, which is we think, oh, we better sell the best product to customers, whereas actually these connectedness forms of benefits can be much louder. We basically pivoted the whole project, recreated the platform to focus on social learning. First page is a global map where you just see these pulsating bubbles where you can identify people around the world, click on their photos, message them. The first day we had 300 learners, 13,000 profile views. All they want to do is check each other out, right? This is before the content. The content, content can come later. The first thing we want to do is just get to know each other. Uh, it's a very humbling moment, I will say. Uh, then we integrated social learning through everything in the experience. And for the next minute, I just want you to think about what are the ways in which we're taking advantage of this peer-to-peer. -peer. So we have people submit uh, answers to polls, which we require them to answer. They then see everyone's answers. That tells them, well, how is my answer different from others? They can connect and message others. Discussion boards. Uh, we said most online discussion boards don't work. To get people to answer each other's questions, let's actually think about why they don't work. Well, first of all, it's because people don't have an incentive to answer other people's questions. So we told the online learners, part of your grade depends on the extent to which you answer other people's questions. Just that little tweak, 75% of the learners move to the discussion boards. Then we said, let's make it local to a page so it's relevant and searchable. Let's make it fun. Let's get rid of the fear factor where people can tag their questions with uh, a little tag saying, you know, I'm asking a really basic question. That allows me to ask the question because now I've said I'm asking a basic question, right? Those are the behavioral details we were trying to overcome. Uh, we even introduced something called the online cold call. So you're going through the course and suddenly at random, a pop-up appears and it says, Mikhail, you've been cold called. You have a minute to answer this question, 30 words or less. And your answer is visible to the entire cohort with your profile picture. It suddenly raises the stakes for individuals. By the way, the thing I'd love for you to take away is not the specifics of these features, but that you've got to integrate this kind of connectedness in product development. Most newspapers tell me, oh, Bharat, we actually have peer-to-peer. -peer. I'm like, where? Oh, we have these comment sections on the newspapers. I don't know for anyone who's been to those comments sections of those discussion boards. It's a crime against humanity, right? It's basically we're thinking about creating the best content and then we slap on the discussion board at the end. And of course, if you don't pay attention to it, most readers aren't going to pay attention to it and you will get basically trolls taking over. Uh, this is the geography of conversations that uh, arose from the online uh, efforts. It gave rise to interactivity, community, conversation, online interactions, giving rise to offline interactions. And finally, when we saw this was happening, we said, let's leverage this community by also inviting our online learners to campus. So we sent an email and asked folks to come in for one day to the HPS campus. 600 people show up. They showed up not just to hear us speak, partly to connect with other people who they had first gotten to. This is what starts giving rise to engagement and community and persistence and so on and so forth.
All right. Um, the last story I'll just close with is uh, a story about music. So this is the other major uh, story that happened 20 plus years ago. And this is the decline in CD sales. By the way, if you look at this chart and you ask the question, what caused this decline? This makes newspapers look like a growing industry. The decline is very clear. It starts in 1999. And that's when Napster was launched. Right? So piracy killed the music industry. Or at least that's the story we were told. If you go back to the data and ask the question, what else could have been going on at the same time that caused this decline? Oh, there's probably many other explanations. One, there was the recession in 2000. The second is, this is just a format change. People are moving from CDs to digital music, and that's what's causing this decline in CDs. By the way, if that story were true, we can actually test it. How? Because there were previous format changes in the industry. From vinyl to cassette, cassette to CDs. So we went back and collected this data to see how fast were the declines in previous formats. And here's what the chart looks like. Almost identical. If I think as an executive that file sharing is killing my business, what's the strategic implication? Get the best lawyers in the room and have them make sure we get the IP addresses of people who are fired. On the other hand, if it's just a format change, the only strategic question to ask is how can I make money in the new format? Right? And it turns out there's many ways to make money. One is uh, broadband services. So just as Warner Music is suffering, Time Warner Cable Sister Division is growing. You're making money off digital music, off the hardware and MP3 players, and quite interestingly, off live events. So the price of concerts used to more or less track the rate of inflation till the late 90s. Piracy explodes, concert prices explode. Why? Because 20 years ago, concerts were priced low. They were basically the advertisement for you and me to go and buy CDs. Now that we can't control the price of music, that relationship flips. Free music is the advertisement to go to the live concert, which we can't pirate. By the way, there's a lot of money to be made for talent in the concerts business. Talent used to get $1 out of every $15 on a CD, but they take home 70 cents on the dollar in concerts. Taylor Swift is making $5 million a night when she goes and gives a concert, right? Artists are actually happy. Think about the music business. Universal Music, the largest record label, sold its concerts business in 1999. Why is that? Because we were telling them to do that. We were saying, focus on your core business, focus on core competence. That's where you need to make money. Actually, when a market is declining, you want to think more expansively about which adjacent businesses can I get into? And this is the second big idea that I'd love to share, which is it's not about products. It's about product connections. By the way, what's interesting is as digital has grown, the demand for live events not just music, uh, educational uh, events, speaking events, by the way, yoga festivals, who would have thought that, right? Like 10,000 people show up to yoga festivals. It's amazing. Uh, here's a chart looking at the music industry. The dark black line is what happened to CD sales. There's pretty much nothing you can do as a manager, no matter how smart you are, to stem that decline. But the question is, what complementary businesses can I get into? And if you add up the complementary businesses in music, actually the music industry has never been in better shape. It just so happens value moved from CDs to other parts of the business. This question is a much more general question than music and CDs. It's about identifying complements to your core product. That's where the value can often migrate in digital settings. And just to give you a sense, this is not just about hot dogs and ketchup, cars and roads. Imagine one without the other. Uh, imagine a tire company getting into the business of telling us where the best gourmet food is. According to the logic of core competence, Michelin executives should have been fired when they did this. Except it was brilliant because they started telling people in Paris a hundred years ago about those great restaurants in the south of France. You've got to drive there. 
that's going to help the car business. Uh, as movie theaters found it harder and harder, and this was pre-COVID, to get people to go to the theaters, what are the things you can do? Oh, let's give bigger popcorn packets. Let's make bigger seats, food in your seats, and so on. It turns out some theaters went to the root of the problem. And they started offering babysitting services right next door. For a lot of people, we go to the theaters, we get married, we keep going to the movies. Once we have kids, we completely stop going to the movies. Why? We need babysitting. They charge market prices for both these services, completely sold out. Um, this really gets to the core question, I think, in digital uh, conversations, which is what business are you really in? And how can you create compliments to your core products that allow you to leverage this? I'll just close by noting that we take the premise <clears throat> that content is king, but when you think about the complementary services and products to content, whether it's hardware, software, advertising, e-commerce, most of the digital giants are sitting in the outer circle. For each of them, they make 90% of their money through that particular product, whether it's hardware for Apple, software for Microsoft, advertising for Google, Facebook. If I'm in those businesses in the outer circle, I want content to be as cheap as possible. You want your complement to be cheap because it helps your core product. More than $5 trillion of value in the outer circle in the last 15 years. Another way of saying this is if you believe content is king, you better believe compliments are King Kong. <laughs> That's just my phrase of the day. Uh, and by the way, uh, this applies to talent as well, right? They are now even leveraging most of that business. So content or product is everyone else's compliment. Think about which business you're in because that can be really the name of the game. Uh, I'll just close with this, which is every time a new technology comes along, we think it's going to substitute for our business. In every one of these cases, it turned out to be a compliment. By the way, DVRs and advertising, we thought DVRs were going to kill advertising. It turns out it didn't. Why? Well, there was ad skipping technology before the DVR. It was called the neck. I could simply turn away from the ad on the TV when the ad came on or go to the kitchen or to the restroom. Uh, it's just something we take for granted, right? It's just, I thought this was quite amusing. When you produce a digital product, which is identical to your physical product, you're basically telling the customer, treat these as substitutes. But how can I get them to treat these as compliments? Well, think about live streaming of sports. If all we think about is live streaming online, that's a substitute for the TV. But what's a complementary product digitally that might enhance TV viewing? Fantasy sports. Fantasy is the biggest area of online growth for, for uh, the sports industry. And by the way, people who play fantasy watch more TV. Why? Because we want to watch the real games which are implicating our fantasy scores. And I'm not just watching my local team, I'm watching all the teams in the league, I'm watching blowouts, I'm watching crappy teams. This has been the best thing for the NFL. So this is the question I'd love for you to think about. What is the analog of that fantasy product in your business? Uh, this, these are companies which have made huge strides online. In every single case, it's not just product or content. It's content and community. And so I just want to close with the, coming back to the first slide that I'd laid out. It's not just about quality, it's about networks and compliments. It's not just hub to spoke, it's leveraging spoke to spoke. It's not just reach, it's engagement. It's not just being creative and playing the lottery. It's coming up with these sustainable machines that can leverage what we do. It's not just data, it's experiences. Or another way to say this is, um, I'd love for you to think about digital success, not just in terms of product, but in terms of Uh, thank you so much, uh, Bharat. That was definitely thought-provoking, and you you um, you are really uh, pushing us to, to to think harder about the next day. Um, before I give the um, uh, the baton to uh, to Erol to uh, manage the questions, and we will have about twenty minutes uh, for them. Just two two points. Um, uh, one, 
the just the, the speech part, uh, we are going to have it um, uh, available. Uh, it has been recorded, and we'll have it available for all people who have registered for the for the, for the event. Not not the Q and A, but the speech part.